Hello and welcome. You're watching Political Capital. This is the show where Delhi meets the Lal Street. I'm Vivek Law. UPA 2's tenure has been marked by policy paralysis and uncertainties regarding the tax regime. As we head into the elections, what do investors seek from the next government? In fact, a Grant Thornton report released recently shows that business leaders are increasingly frustrated with the taxation policies. Avantika joins us up first with the findings of the report. Well, big tax issues have certainly been grabbing headlines over the last year, be it the massive transfer pricing cases that have come into litigation or the fallout of the retrospective amendment. Now, let me just run you some of, through some of the findings of the Grant Thornton report. According to the survey, nearly 45% of business leaders in India felt that tax laws and policies do not tax the correct people at the correct levels. Nearly 44% do not feel that the Indian tax system encourages compliance. And now, another very interesting finding was that nearly 74% are concerned that the current tax laws do not bring enough economic participation into the tax base. Now, this is way above the global average, which stands at 43%. So, certainly, India Inc. is not happy with the current tax regime. In fact, corporates have repeatedly cried foul over their big tax demands, and foreign investors have been on the fence, saying that they're worried about the uncertainty surrounding both domestic and international taxation. Now, the increasing levels of litigation is certainly a clear indication of this. Currently, nearly 4.0 5 trillion rupees are involved in tax litigation and last year the parliamentary standing committee on finance had slammed the IT department and the government's tax policies saying that the orders by the IT departments are high pitched and the tax policies being pursued are not as progressive as they ought to be. So will these recommendations be taken into account by the next government and how far will the new government take tax reforms? These questions will certainly be decisive coming elections. Back to you. All right, so what should the new government's tax agenda be? We at Bloomberg TV India spoke to a whole host of policy makers and politicians. Their verdict, the taxation regime shouldn't punish investors. Hum rationalize or simplify tax system chaate hain. Jo transparent ho, e-governance ke saath judi ho, jo bhrashtachar ko samapt karne wali ho, kala dhan ko generate na karne wali ho. और सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट ग्रोथ के लिए फ्रेंडली हो और सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट चीज जो है कि आज हमारे देश में हम इन्वेस्टर को चोर जैसा देख रहे हैं ये बहुत गलत है अगर कोई सरकार परमिशन देती है तो इन्वायरमेंट वाले काम रोक देते हैं उन्होंने नहीं रोका तो हाईकोर्ट रोक देती है हाईकोर्ट नहीं रोका तो सुप्रीम कोर्ट रोकती तीनों ने कुछ नहीं रोका तो सीबीआई रोक देती है देखिए अगर हमारे देश में इन्वेस्टमेंट फ्री एटमोस्फेयर नहीं होगा तो एम्प्लॉयमेंट पोटेंशियल कैसे मिलेगा and a change of law is required appropriate legislation then amendments must be brought out as the responsibility of the government i have not understood the logic for a retrospective legislation governments might make mistakes but they must stand up in that case and accept that a mistake it's an error don't punish the investor a retrospective legislation punishes investors you will endeavor to correct that at the earliest i have been um, uh, clear and open about my uh, sincere belief that retrospectivity in tax law uh, should only be uh, corrective in the sense of benefiting mainly the taxpayer if there has had been an error in uh, some kind of error certainly it should not be used uh, to uh, uh, to change the law in such a way that investment decisions become uncertain all right joining me now on the show is sunil jain partner at j sagar associates and sudhir kapadia who's a partner and leader business tax services at ey thank you very much gentlemen both of you we have been speaking to you both all through the year and beyond in terms of the issues that came up as we get into elections my first question to both of you would be we've heard leaders like narendra modi talk about putting an end to tax terrorism that's the word and that he's coined but let's get down to setting the agenda so dear let me come to you first what according to you should be the two or three things that the next government whoever comes to power must do to set right the tax system right vivek i think uh, uh, it, it's very clear what the pain points are as you said you know they have been discussed often now by now 
uh, and uh, in, simply put, you know, uh, the way we stand today in our country, tax policy is tax administration, or to put it the other way around, tax administration is tax policy. What I mean is, you can lay down a very nice uh, tax policy, whichever government comes to power, how it will be implemented is the key. I think if I were to mention just two points uh, in the tax administration area, uh, one is that uh, you know, there is time now for Indian tax administration to adopt what I call a risk assessment methodology for corporate taxpayers, uh, which has been adopted. You know, I heard Shom's comments in this, in this program earlier, and he has advised UKHMRC actually on this, which is where you say that based on a corporate's disclosures, you know, whether they have adopted sharp tax practices or they have been very moderate or balanced in their approach based on their conduct, you actually assign some kind of risk weightages and don't waste time, in a way, going after those taxpayers, those corporates, you know, who have been largely compliant, right? And actually uh, spend all your energy on really, really uh, tough tax uh, kind of companies who have adopted tough tax positions, which are very sharp, etc. What this does is it gives a motivation to those companies who don't want to, you know, err on the on the aggressive side to say, if we stay within this line, we'll be treated, you know, very moderately, treated with trust. Today, what is happening is that there is there is lack of trust. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of company you are, what kind of you know disclosures you have been making, what kind of positions you have been taking. Everybody is more or less treated on par, which is to say that we don't trust you and we'll be after, you know, we'll, we'll do detailed audits and assessments for each and every case. I think that is one. And the second one, which I think uh, will go a long way, is effective dispute resolution. See, today we have a dispute resolution panel, but it is not effective. Uh, I think one single goal should be of any tax administration going forward, how successful we are in reducing the number of disputes going up to the tribunal and to the courts. You can see all around the world the number of transfer pricing disputes because they are so factual, which go to the tribunal, go to the courts, are very, very few. You can count them on your fingertips. So this dispute resolution panel has to work more effectively. We have to empower those members, bring more independent panelists there. And most companies, I can tell you, most companies would look forward to a, to a format where you can discuss these kind of disputes across the table, have some kind of give and take, and move on. Nobody wants to litigate to the Supreme Court, have uncertainty, spend time, money, energy. They would rather focus on expansion of business and investments. The APA is a great example, but that is for proposed transactions. Uh, you, know, you don't know what disputes come up uh, when the audit takes place. So therefore, an effective APA along with an effective dispute resolution mechanism is the need of the hour. I think if these two points uh, uh, the tax administration were to you know, focus on under a new government, that would make a huge difference in the way tax policy gets experienced on the ground uh, by the taxpayers. Right. Sunil, uh, the opening question to you as well. What would be your two or three points of suggestion? We of course did hear Narendra Modi at uh, FIKI say, I want to get suggestions from tax experts. We're not saying he's going to come to power yet, but if he does, what would your suggestions be to the next government, whichever is coming to power? Well, the fundamental aspects in relation to any tax laws are as to how you define the charge, the liability, the tax that is payable on a particular transaction, and then how the taxpayer and the tax department collaborate cooperate with each other in collection of those taxes by way of payment of advanced taxes as well as, as, well as withholding taxes, tax deduction at source. And then comes uh, the stage of written filing and uh, assessment by the tax department. I think uh, when we talk about the tax liability, the charge, the levy of taxes, direct taxes code is something that we should look at very seriously. And we should be able to provide a tax law that holds true, that holds relevant for next few decades. As far as uh, collection is concerned, we are facing a large number of issues on the tax withholding side. We don't have clarity on whether a payment constitutes royalties, a fee for technical services, and so on and so forth, when the payments are being made from India to a foreign party abroad. We are staring uh, at a scenario where general anti governance rules will come into picture by 1st of April 2016. We need more clarity on how the construct of GAR, 
uh, will come up. And as far as assessments of taxes is concerned, once a return has been filed, I think uh, largely we will have to minimize the kind of tax disputes, the number of tax disputes that goes out of the tax department. At the first assessment level, as far as and as well as the first appeal level by the commissioner appeal, we will have to minimize the cases that moves out to tribunals, to high court and supreme court. And instead of the current regime where absolutely every single case gets or have a chance of getting a relief at the tax appellate tribunal and high courts, we should see whether we can convert the mechanism within the tax department that is of first level assessment as well as first appeal with the commissioner appeal to more of a review of whether taxes have been paid correctly and we have a review officer in place of a commissioner appeal who can look at whether the correct taxes have been paid by the taxpayer and whether the justice has been meted out at the first assessment level instead of the present commissioner appeal mechanism that we have and as far as beyond the tax right. department is concerned the move to tax tribunal I think you know the current era is largely about tribunalization we have specific uh, purpose tribunals dealing with sensor specific areas like taxation and therefore national tax tribunal which has been in contemplation for a while uh, should be given a serious shot at we have some other legislations like company law and securities laws and SEBI laws having uh, appellate tribunal that deals with the regulatory issues coming out from the first level uh, assessment and adjudication carried out by various regulators and then the appeal directly moves to Supreme Court on very important substantial questions of law removing the high court stage which we clearly need to do in the income tax arena as well as well as the indirect tax arena to be able to minimize the tax dispute. All right, we go into more specific issues, but we take a quick break here. Sudhir Kapatia and Sunil Jain both with me. We come back in just a minute. Welcome back. You're watching Political Capital. Sunil Jain and Sudhir Kapatia both with me. Sudhir, uh, one of the first things that the new government will probably do is to look at that entire DTC bit. Uh, the BJP leaders we've spoken to so far have clearly indicated that they would want to review it and see what they want to do with it in terms of the changes. You've had a look at it, I'm sure, at every stage of its uh, evolution so far. Now that it is going to be reviewed again, what would be specific to DTC one or two points that you would like to suggest? Well, I think the first is, uh, Vivek, I would hope that uh, there is a broad consensus on, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the features of the DTC. Uh, because as I have said before, the precursor to the DTC was actually the Kelkar Committee recommendations, which were actually set up by the NDA government. And if you see DTC version 1, uh, it followed that, uh, you know, it followed those recommendations by essentially recommending rationalization and elimination of most tax exemptions in lieu of lower tax rates. That's the best way to expand the tax base, have a much lower, you know, tax burden, uh, and, and still not, you know, prejudice revenue uh, adversely. Also, as you know, Vivek, that uh, the standing committee headed by uh, Yashwan Sinha, which went into the DTC, made its own recommendations on certain matters. Uh, and, you know, then there were new versions of it. So, first of all, I would hope that the broad uh, direction of the DTC uh, would be adhered to even by the new government, if, assuming there is a change in government, as you said. Now, there are two, in, two or three interesting points about the DTC, Vivek. You know, one is, uh, uh, I, if I remember the standing committee uh, observations on the DTC, they actually made an observation which rings uh, very similar to what, the, as you said, what the main opposition party is even today talking about, is a clear indication of reducing the tax burden on the lower middle class, you know, and the middle class uh, income earners. So the standing committee talked about hiking the standard deduction or even linking it to the inflation index so that you know the real income exemption uh, limit goes up and if that is implemented then you know of course many more millions of taxpayers pretty much go out of the tax net the second aspect of the DTC the original version one interestingly was a very low rate of uh, individual taxation between 10 to 25 percent now that would have meant a huge you know uh, sort of uh, sacrifice 
of revenue. And I don't know whether uh, that indeed would be something which a new government can, you know, can afford to do uh, based on their calculations of collection of revenues. And the third aspect of DTC was the whole corporate tax uh, you know, policy. And that's where, at least if you look at the global trend, where there is a clear trend for reduction of the corporate tax rate, and of course rationalization of exemptions as well, because the you know the 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 whole principle behind this is that if there are more corporate profits which are available to invest back into business, it creates more jobs, and when people earn more income, obviously you get more taxation from those uh, income earners, whether it is income tax or it is indirect taxes. So looked at as a whole, anything which encourages investments. And I think a time has come where in India, the whole mantra of encouraging investment was always looked at through the prism of deductions and exemptions, keeping the tax rates a little moderately high. I think that needs to be done away with. We should look at the whole prism of investments and employment through, you know, a lesser number of very, very focused deductions if still required. But as I said, a more, like for example, surcharges. So the, when I say lowering the tax rate, it's, you know, if you just remove the surcharges, which were meant to be temporary, that's a straight four or four and a half percent reduction in the headline rate of taxation and goes back to what the DTC had recommended, which was 30 percent for corporate tax. I think it should be seriously looked at. The second aspect is you have the dividend distribution right. tax, which again has been saddled with surcharges. The DTC talks about 15 percent. We have gone right up to 18%. So I think there are some very simple, uh, you know, areas or aspects which should be considered by by any new government. And by whatever name called, you call it DTC, you call it amendment to the law. I do expect these two or three things uh, to be addressed, actually, uh, because those are uh, relatively easy fixes, in my view. Okay. So, Neil, you touched upon the GAR bit earlier on this show. And we've been talking about this ever since that uh, bombshell was dropped on investors. Are there issues there even now? Because, of course, the markets, thanks to the fact that, you know, the government just deferred it by three years, seems to have taken its eyes off that issue. But is that still an open issue which the new government is going to have to fix? And the second question, this entire retrospective bit, this entire Vodafone bit, hasn't got fixed yet. It's obviously going to be the next government which is going to have to fix it. What would your suggestion be? Yes. So let's begin with GAR. Now, when it was posted for April 1, 2016, it always meant that the next government, uh, next uh, dispensation at the center is going to take a look at as to how uh, GAR, the whole paraphernalia associated with GAR will play out and as to how GAR will apply it on uh, domestic transaction as well as cross-border transactions. Now, today the international tax scenario is becoming very difficult for foreign taxpayers. They need to have a PAN number if they want to suffer tax withholding on limited rates. They need to produce a tax residency certificate from their jurisdictional tax officer to prove that they are entitled to the benefits of the treaty between India and their country. And then there are so many other hurdles in their way before they can lend technology, before they can lend their IPRs into Indian companies and make them money. So those aspects uh, still require a little bit of clarity. Uh, we should be uh, laying out before international investors community our approach towards Singapore and Mauritius. That's largely uh, the focus areas for GAR as far as cross-border trade is concerned. Now coming to the uh, Vodafone indirect transfer. Now, if we were to have a direct taxes code soon, at least there is some clarity in the direct tax code provisions that unless and until you have 50% of the fair market value of the assets in India, an indirect transfer of shares of a company outside India will at least not be taxable in India. But the point is that there is no clarity in the law as it stands amended in the Income Tax Act and it applies retrospectively. Government has already set up expert committee under Dr. Shom, which has made some very helpful recommendations. We have heard that is there is no disagreement with those recommendations, but we are yet to see the implementation of some of those helpful recommendations. Primarily, a removal of at least the retrospectivity and introducing a fair criteria that could be 50%, or we can review and come up with a more 
uh, acceptable formula. But that should be the direction. We clearly need to provide simplicity, certainty, and uh, also on the assessment level, we need to have more and more clarity uh, within the tax department as well as when the matter moves to the High Court and Supreme Court, there should be more clarity for the investors, the taxpayers, and we uh, should be able to provide a more just and stable tax regime uh, for the national and international investment ecosystem. So here is the retrospective issue, still an issue with global investors, or has it over a period of time now been just uh, moved towards being a specific company kind of a case and people have forgotten about it? Is it still an issue which you deal with when you are talking to global investors? No, Vivek, that's a very good question. I was just going to supplement what Sunil said. You know, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to make this clear, Vivek, in my view and based on my experience and interactions with foreign investors, it is certainly not just a one company issue. And I'll tell you why. Because if you look at some of the largest institutional funds and private equity players in the world, there are lots of funds available today. And I'm talking of institutional funds. Forget about, you know, small funds, you know, here and there. Uh, they, they certainly would look at uh, India uh, more favorably if this niggling uncertainty about indirect transfers is addressed, uh, you know, as far as they are concerned. And this is all about prospectivity, right? Uh, as you can imagine, no large, uh, you know, institutional investor who's, who keeps money in trust virtually for, you know, for the large pension, for their large number of pensioners on behalf of education endowments, sometimes, you know, sovereign wealth funds on behalf of the government. None of them would like to commit uh, such large sums which they hold in trust Without that certainty that tomorrow some transfer happens outside of India, it should not, they should not be visited, you know, with an unexpected tax bill. So I think it is in India's interest. And any new government, I think, has the cardinal duty, in my view, in the first budget which they, which they present, to at least address the prospective part, uh, which anyways is there in the direct tax code. If, you, if for whatever reasons the direct tax code is going to be deferred, at least bring that part onto the statute book, in my view. Sudhir and Sunil, thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. We'll keep coming back to you because uh, in the next two months, it is going to be a key issue in the politics, in the political arena, and we would like to present two experts an agenda on fixing the tax regime in this country to the next government. Thank you very much for joining us.